Hey there, everyone. I'm Patrick Ferguson from Skull Splitter Dice here to talk about another game system and how to switch over to it from 5e, especially if that's what you're used to. You might have heard of a little Kickstarter project called Coyote and Crow, a futuristic alternate history setting and system focusing on advanced Native American cultures. If you're anything like me, you were immediately intrigued by that concept, and now that it's here, I'm really eager to talk about it. So let's get into it. Coyote and Crow is a narrative-driven system seeped in Native American lore and solar punk style. It's flashy, unique, and focuses on tale-telling in a way that can lead to whole mythologies forming at your table as time and generations pass. The world of Coyote and Crow is idyllic and utopian, but not without conflict. The nations have warred before, and many tensions are high. There are strange and ancient spirits and creatures that persist among the lands, and the onset of the empowered Adenati is allowing mortal man to peer into the unknown. If you're looking to create a story with your players with a bit of mechanical oomph to back it up, then Coyote and Crow might be the game for you and your group. Coyote and Crow is a small system right now, and while that means there isn't a lot out there, it also means you don't have to worry about picking up many books. In fact, you only need one book to play it, and that's the Coyote and Crow core rulebook. A physical copy is a bit pricey, admittedly, usually running about 70 bucks, and it's nearly 500 pages, to be fair, just to point that out. But you can pick up the PDF direct from the creators or from sites like DriveThruRPG for $25, and I have to say, that's quite a bargain for what you're getting. On the flip side of this, CNC has a unique dice system based on D12s, and you're going to need a lot of them. If you're a chronic dice collector like I am, you might have enough D12s from other sets lying around, but if not, there are CNC-specific sets for sale as well. You'll need about 10 of these buggers, and you'll want a few of them to be easily distinguished from the rest to use as critical dice. Now let's finally crack into the world of Coyote and Crow. It's a combination of setting and system, but it's a setting first. The core book delves deeply into this alternate history where a comet strike in the 1400s plunged the Earth into a new ice age. Our games are set nearly 700 years after the Awas, focusing on the new nations, cultures, and technologies that successfully endured the long freeze and rose up within what we now call North America. What we now call North America as in like what me and you call North, it's not called North America in the book, obviously. The Awas brought with it the gifts of the Adenati, people born with spiritual powers, identified by the color purple showing up in their hair, eyes, or other markings. Nature has also awoken with these spiritual powers, and as a result, gifted creatures walk the plains and haunt the woods. The burgeoning spiritual powers have also brought on more awareness of the Black, a spiritual world adjacent to our own, filled with indescribable wonders and potential threats. A lot of CNC is honestly vibes, combining authentic Native American cultures and mythos with a solar punk utopian aesthetic. Technology progressed differently. We've got VR headsets, hover skiffs, and 3D printers, but no factories, no gunpowder, and strangely, no wheels, or at least no wheeled vehicles, that is. The nations aren't perfect by any means, and their histories are rife with wars and conflicts, but generally speaking, civilization, as the players find it, is largely idyllic, advanced, and harmonious with nature. The players themselves are typically Adenati, tasked by their tribes to use their gifts to keep peace or complete epic tasks. I know the internet hates when we talk about this kind of thing, but I feel the need to briefly bring up cultural sensitivity of this system, or rather, the cultural sensitivity needed in order to run this system. While the world of Coyote and Crow has diverged drastically from our own, it's still rooted in real-world cultures and history. Living cultures not your own can be a touchy space to play in, believe me, I understand that. And while the book does a good job to address this, it'll ultimately be on the GMs and players to address it as well. Keep this in mind when putting together your Coyote and Crow campaign. Now let's go through some of the fundamental rules you'll be working with in CNC, starting with dice checks and target numbers. Fundamentally, Coyote and Crow boils most actions down to skill rolls. You'll be rolling a number of d12s that will go up or down depending on your stats, your skill ranks, and other circumstances that can add or remove dice from your pool. Once you figure out how many d12s you're rolling, your GM should let you know your target number. Any result on your dice that is equal to or higher than the target number is a success. The more difficult something is, the higher the target number should be, and an average target number is 8. After you roll, there are a few extra ways that characters can fudge their dice, such as using their mind score to nudge die results up. Or, if they have legendary ranks, they can nudge some dice up for free. Next, for every result of 12, you get to roll another die called a critical die. 
Any result higher than a 1 on a critical die adds a success, and if the result would also hit the target number or higher, it counts as two successes. Exactly how many successes you need to actually do something depends on what you're trying to do. Some skills may have a set number required to pass or fail, while some might be incremental and have ways to partially succeed or succeed a lot. When making attacks, for example, the number of successes you make is the amount of damage you deal. Now let's talk primary actions and secondary actions. Coyote and Crow uses a system of primary actions and secondary actions, and on each of the player's turn, they can make up to one primary action and any number of secondary actions so long as they don't conflict with each other. For players used to 5e, the primary action should make perfect sense. Your primary action is very much like an action in 5e. You can make a skill check, which is also how you make an attack, or use an ability. You get one primary action per turn, and you can also use up your primary action to do a secondary action again. Secondary actions are a bit more nebulous by design. In some ways, they work in the same way as a 5e bonus action, since there are several abilities that utilize a secondary action, and you can use secondary actions to do things like reload weapons, speak to allies, or defend yourself. What's interesting here is that you have an unlimited secondary actions count, so long as you don't use the same one twice, and the actions don't contradict with one another, that is. So for example, you could dive behind cover and reload your weapon, but you couldn't also start dodging while stuck in behind cover. Your movement is also a secondary action, so really most of a turn will be taking several secondary actions along with one big primary action. Now let's talk range and positioning. Coyote and Crow uses a very abstract theater of the mind method when it comes to range and positioning and doesn't really lend itself towards miniatures or maps. Much to much to my disappointment. Instead, things are said to be a short, medium, or long distance away from each other. A short range is something you could reach within one's round of movement, which could include things adjacent to you or things on the very edge of that movement range. A medium range is something that would take two movement actions to reach and is described as something too far to touch but also enough to see, and is generally the range you'd fire ranged weapons at. And then long range is something that would take four or more movement actions to reach, and is described as something from really far to just visible on the horizon. Some really long range weapons might be able to reach these lengths, but generally it's a range you'll need to close the distance on to interact with. Ultimately though, this system will be very hard to track for any complicated combats, and that's fine since combat is definitely not where the game is centered around. Coyote and Crow is a very narrative driven game, and you shouldn't expect many protracted combat encounters. Now let's talk about switching over to Coyote and Crow, and I'm going to start by addressing the Dungeon Masters watching this video, as I think that you will either love or hate what it's going for depending on your DM style. Coyote and Crow is a primarily narrative system. It's light on combat and heavily invested in creating a communal story rather than tactics. Depending on how you run 5e games, this may or may not be a big departure for you, but it's something you'll have to get used to when going into this setting. Chaining together combats is not how you'll get the most out of this game. Let your players be clever, talk things out, and come up with creative solutions to their problems. Think of the game much more like an act of collaborative storytelling, even more so than D&D, and try to only use the dice when their skills and aptitude are really being challenged. Coyote and Crow encourages you to weave narratives and then to allow those stories to change in the retelling. Whenever you reach the end of a major arc or story, encourage each player to retell that story from their character's perspective as the main protagonist. Each player's stories combine to form the varied retellings of the event as they happen creating a natural mythos and legend based on the player's actions. Coyote and Crow encourages you to build not only stories, but entire sagas. Save snippets of the player's retold stories to tell the next batch of characters, even if they're the same players. The stories can stretch and squash, but over multiple story arcs, you build entire sagas. The goal here is to create a sort of verbal history that your players share with each other. And again, the game is vibes. These stories can range from campfire story all the way to important cultural legends. Now let's talk about the three path concept. Coyote and Crow actively encourages you and your players to avoid combat and to always provide multiple methods to solve any given problem. They call this idea the three path concept, which when boiled down, basically means having three methods of dealing with any conflict. These paths can be anything you'd like, but generally when you plan out a conflict, the system wants you to have three ideas ready for how your players solve that problem. Mind you, if they come up with some other fourth thing, that's also great, maybe even better, but you should be prepping multiple solutions for any given encounter. Now let's go through the biggest changes that you'll feel switching over to Coyote and Crow as a player, starting with the abilities and skills. 
Coyote and Crow has a lot of building blocks for a given character. All in all, you'll be assembling the following pieces. That's motivation, archetype, path, ability points, skill points, gifts and burdens, starting equipment, background, short-term goals, long-term goals, and I think that's it. Try not to get too intimidated by all that though, and I'm sure a lot of you players out there really aren't at all if you've played more complex systems. It'll take a bit of character creation time, but after that, things really do get simple. Really, all of these options boil down to skill roles. Coyote and Crow functions on almost exclusively skill roles, and all these building blocks for your character functionally just add bonuses or penalties to certain skill roles. When it comes to what goals you're building towards, CNC doesn't have character levels and instead advances using things called short-term and long-term goals. At any given time, you should have two short-term goals and one long-term goal picked out. These goals are always tied to improving yourself and take set number of game sessions to complete. Let's say your character has a short-term goal of getting better at cooking. Currently, your character has a cooking skill of two. Once you choose this goal, you'll mark down every time you finish a game session, and after the second game session is complete, your cooking skill will improve from two to three. If you want to keep getting better at cooking, the next time it will take three game sessions and so on and so forth. The long-term goals work exactly the same way, just for bigger stakes, such as gaining entirely new abilities, increasing core stats, or gaining new psychic powers. As the long-term would imply, these goals take considerably more game sessions to complete and tend to range from 4 to 12 game sessions to achieve. Coyote and Crow doesn't have hit points like you'd be used to in 5e. Instead, you essentially have three separate hit point pools, body, mind, and soul. Each of these point pools is determined by adding different core stats together, and they represent different aspects of your well-being. Body is the closest thing to hit points that you'd be familiar with, and it represents your physical health. If you get physically injured, it's your body that takes the hit. Mind is your mental health, and it can get reduced by taking psychological damage. It also uniquely can be spent to alter your roles, representing your mental exertion, focusing, and trying to overcome problems. Soul is your spiritual health and well-being. Angry spirits and other mystical threats can deal soul damage, making it a far more important health score for certain encounters. Once you take damage in any of these scores, you can heal them by taking short or long rests, which function pretty similarly to how they do in 5e. On a short rest, you can make a check for each of your scores, and you can restore a point on each score you succeed in. Long rests automatically restore points in each score equal to your base stat. You can also recover points through various skills like healing or ceremonies, and some of these special abilities can also provide healing. Now that we've gotten the individual stuff out of the way, let's talk about what you can expect from a C&C game. Coyote and Crow is a narrative game, as I've mentioned before, with a strong emphasis on storytelling and diplomacy. The world has some dark corners, but for the most part, the world is a utopia filled with people in harmony with both nature and each other. If you're looking for an upbeat narrative game with a spiritual center, you'll find a pretty comfortable play space in Coyote and Crow. With that flowery description out of the way, let's answer some specific questions. But before I get into some specific FAQs, I think it best to answer a rather broad question that I've heard a lot of. Uh, is this game for everyone? That's the most diplomatic way to put it. I've seen a surprising amount of discourse regarding the system, and if it can somehow be cultural appropriation to play it without ties to a Native American heritage. I can say at the very least the author's stated intent is for the system to be enjoyed by everyone regardless of their ancestry. Players are advised, however, to not create caricatures or stereotypes of Native American peoples in their role-playing, which should apply for just... that should apply for every situation, not just this game, by the way. Uh, so is this game for everyone? Yes, if you're not a terrible person, I guess. <laughs> or at very least, yes, I think this game is for everyone that's willing to put in even just a few minutes of Google searching before they try it out, maybe. Uh, anyway, with that all aside, uh, let's get into a more specific question, like what's with the Coyote and Crow dice game? Well, Coyote and Crow released a dice game that you can pick up for about $20 that confuses some people when picking up the main game. The dice game is a completely separate product and game that makes use of the Coyote and Crow lore, but does not interact with the tabletop RPG. It does, however, contain a bunch of D12s, which if you plan on playing CNC, this might be worth getting. Are there any supplemental Coyote and Crow books? Well, not yet. A supplemental book called Stories of the Freelands is in development and was funded at the same time as the dice game and the DM screen, but it has yet to drop. 
Keep on the lookout for these adventures at the time of recording as they could be coming out in the near future. If you can't wait, there is a novel set in the Coyote and Crow world titled Hemlock and Sage, and that you can pick up to use for inspiration or if you just find the setting interesting like I do. Yes, I do recommend it personally. I don't read a whole lot, but I read it and I liked it. I would recommend it. If there are any dungeon masters out there that are like me and prefer the narrative element of D&D over to a lot of the mechanical minutia, I think you'll really be into what Coyote and Crow is trying to offer. And even if that's not something you think you'd be into, I highly recommend trying at least once or twice just to see how your group responds. I am of the opinion that everyone is a storyteller at heart, so I really do think at the end of the day, even people that aren't into this concept could have fun with it. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Be sure to like and subscribe because we're putting out new content all the time. Feel free to go check out what we're doing over at SkullSplitterDice.com, see what new dice that we have. And if you guys are planning on trying the system out, I would absolutely love to hear about your sessions down in the comments, especially with it being such a narrative-driven system. And I know some of you out there love leaving me long comments to read. I read all of them. Tell me about your stories with this system. I really want to hear about it. Any kind of narrative-driven system, I'm easily more interested in what people have to tell me about their sessions. Thanks again for watching. My name is Patrick Ferguson from Skull Splitter Dice, and until next time, farewell.